Welcome back to Rouse Rising. This is my little homestead on the internet where I share with you all all about our holistic lifestyle and making foods from scratch. Today we are focusing on my very own sourdough bread recipe. This recipe begins the day before with a leaven. I always make my leaven at night just before I go to bed and then my leaven works all night long fermenting and getting itself ready and active for the next day's dough. This is a double recipe so I just double batch my recipe every single time to make four loaves Sometimes I triple it and I'll make four loaves and then I'll make an extra two loaves. Uh, and I also use this for pizza crust and a variety of other things. But today we are going to make four sourdough bowls. So for that double recipe, I'm going to start out with 150 grams of starter, 150 grams of flour, and 150 grams of water. All of these are gonna be mixed together in this dish, in this bowl. And then I'm gonna cover this bowl and allow it to sit right here on top of my dishwasher in this little area. Because my dishwasher runs at night, it's gonna emit just enough heat to keep this starter or this leaven warm, happy, and active. You don't have to use a scale. I prefer to use a scale when I do my sourdough because measurements matter. And if you want a consistent loaf of bread, it's just best to measure your dry and wet ingredients. We could use a measuring cup, but those are going to be off just by a little bit. So from my experience, I make the best bread when I measure properly. And you guys know if you've been around my channel, typically I just throw ingredients in, I eyeball everything and I don't typically measure exactly. But with sourdough bread, I always use my trusty kitchen scale to make sure I am making consistent bread. Once I have made my leaven, I have to feed my starter. And I do this by adding 50 grams of water and 50 grams of flour, and I give it a good mix. I put the lid back on. My lid is not airtight. There is not a seal on my lid. I actually removed the gasket that was on this glass jar so that my starter could breathe a little bit. And this is an anchor hawking jar with a glass lid. And these are available at most Walmarts, Fred Meyers, various grocery stores that carry glass storage containers. This is a very common one. I can also leave one linked down below in this video's description if you want a wide mouth glass container like mine that I keep my starter in. This is probably my second or third jar because I have broken jars in the past. Yes, I have. Um, I have had to remake and restart my starter many times. On my sourdough playlist, I have how to make your own sourdough starter from scratch. It just takes about a week's time and it will save you money. You don't have to order one online from anybody. You can make your sourdough starter at home if you have the time and the patience to do that. That is how I've done it each and every time. I've never actually purchased a starter from anyone. Uh, when I first started making sourdough eight years ago, I was given a starter from my aunt and at some point I broke it or killed it or something and had to make my own. So I shared that video with you all. And that's, like I said, linked in my sourdough playlist video. And that's also where you can find how to make two loaves of sourdough bread. I go into great detail sharing about how you can store your dough and use it for the whole week. Um, and then I also share how to make six to eight sourdough loaves at once so that you can pre-bake, pre-slice, and pre-freeze all your bread so that you have bread on the go when you need it. Or you can just have your extra dough sitting in your refrigerator for when you want to bake a fresh loaf of sourdough. So now I'm just going to place my jars of sourdough starter and my bowl of leaven on this countertop. And this is where it's just going to hang out all night long. And then in the morning, you are going to see that the leaven is bubbly. It has doubled and we are ready to make our dough. So here's my leaven the next morning and you can see all those little bubbles in there. We're going to add 
950 grams of water. Remember, this is a double batch of sourdough bread. I will leave the single batch recipe down below in this video's description. So I'm just making sure that I have 950 grams of water. Right now I'm gonna mix up my leaven and you can see that the leaven is floating on top. That is very important. That's how you ensure that you have an active leaven, an active sourdough starter. It should be gaseous and bubbly and it should float to the top of your water because the gas in the leaven is lighter weight than the water, therefore bringing it up to the top. So if that happens, you know that you have a good leaven, you know that you are gonna produce a bubbly loaf of dough. So it is important to make sure that your leaven floats on your water before you move along to the next step. Next, I'm going to be measuring out 1400 grams of flour. If you are making the single batch, which is two loaves of bread, I know it's confusing, but if you're making the single batch, which yields two loaves of bread, you would measure out 700 grams of flour. I always do half all purpose and half whole wheat unbleached bread flour because this yields the best crumb in my experience. Usually when I use all purpose flour, it ferments too quickly. It has huge gaping bubbles in it, which makes huge gaping holes in my loaf of bread. Then it falls, the jelly falls through, the butter falls through, and it makes a mess all over my kids. So what I've discovered is a way to minimize the large holes in the crumb. Now, I know a lot of people prefer the large holes. I don't. I like a more uniform crumb so that it's less messy for my kids. And I do that by squashing my dough and pressing out the bubbles and that sort of thing, but also by the mixture of flour that I use. So you can use all, you know, all purpose or you can use all whole wheat bread flour, you can use unbleached white bread flour, you can use straight up bread flour, uh, whatever you have, it, it will yield different results. So just be aware of that. It's not going to look exactly like mine, but it will still be a delicious bread no matter what flour you use. This is just what I have found works for me. So I measure my 1400 grams of flour into my large KitchenAid mixer. You can also mix it by hand uh, with my bad shoulder. I no longer mix large quantities of dough by hand. So we're gonna do it in the mixer. I make a well with the flour and then I pour in all of my leaven water. Then I'm gonna set this up on my KitchenAid mixer and I'm just gonna let it mix with my, sorry, with my paddle hook. I'm not using my dough hook for this. I just use my paddle hook to get everything incorporated to make a shaggy dough. We don't want this to get overworked at this moment. We're just gonna let it be a shaggy dough so that all of the flour can absorb all of the water. And then we're gonna allow this to rest for 30 minutes while we make our salt water and we're waiting for our salt to dissolve in our warm water. This stage of rest, this 30 minute stage of rest is called the auto lays. And like I said, it's just for the flour to absorb the water and bloom a little bit in there. Then we are going to squish in some salted water. So right now what I'm doing is just scraping off my dough hook. I am going to get this out of the mixer. I'm done with my mixer. Like I said, it was just a real quick mix to get everything incorporated. And I'm gonna allow all of this to sit and rest in this KitchenAid mixing bowl because I'm going to add my salt water to this bowl and get it cleaned out really well and transfer to a wider glass bowl. Just my preferred method. It's just how I prefer to work my dough. And then we're gonna start our stretch and folds. For this batch of dough, we are doing 100 grams of water mixed with 40 grams of salt. Sometimes I go a little bit heavier on the salt because, hey, this Redmond's Real Salt is filled with vital minerals. It is really good for us. The type of salt that you use for your sourdough bread is very important. So you do not want to use any kind of chlorinated or ionized salt. You do not want that. You want to use sea salt or some kind of pure real salt. That is why I always recommend Redmond's Real Salt for its quality, for the fact that it's mined here in Utah in the great United States from ancient seabeds underneath the earth. So you know it's got all the good stuff in it. 
As you can see, I also keep my bread covered, or my dough rather, I keep it covered with a wet cloth. The cloth is really only damp in the middle where it's covering the bread, and I just do that to be sure that I don't dry out the top of my dough between stretch and folds. So now what I did was, I didn't record it, so I'm recording it now, I added all of my salty water to my bowl. Now I'm going to work on scraping down the sides of my bowl, getting all the dough, mixed in there and the salt water helps me get this bowl clean that is why I do this method if I were to have taken the dough out of this bowl earlier and put it in my glass bowl then I would have all this mess and if you know flour dough or flour and bread dough sticks like concrete once it starts to dry it's such a pain to wash off so I'm always very intentional and very thoughtful with my processes when I'm making bread and when I'm working with dough um, I just want to minimize how much washing I need to do. So that is why I add the salt water at this point and I scrape the dough away from the sides. I get this bowl nice and cleaned. And then I'm going to be transferring this to my wide glass bowl. And that just enables me to be able to do my stretch and folds. It allows the dough to expand as it needs to. It just provides an easier working container. So that is why I transfer to a glass bowl. Sure, it makes one more dish, but that's not such a big deal. I'm able to clean my KitchenAid bowl out and I'm gonna put my KitchenAid stand mixer back in its cabinet and get it out of my kitchen so that I have room to work on this bread. This next part is a fun sensory experience. If you wanna get your kids involved, go ahead and get them involved in this part. We are going to squish the salted water into our bread and you saw I just pulled out a piece of wheat it was like a piece of wheat hole um, that was a little bit sharp so I just pulled that out and stuck it in a little glass bowl but we're going to squish all this in and then we're going to allow it to rest for another 30 minutes that's going to allow this uh, dough to absorb this salty water. You can see I'm squishing it and I'm doing my first of six stretch and folds. This first one is just to help get the water incorporated. I'm not really stretching it too much. I'm just trying to get all this mixed in. So I'm going to squish it down, cover it back up with a wet cloth, and then allow this to sit for 30 minutes. Now I have not recorded every single stretch and fold, but I am going to show you a few of these stretch and folds and how the dough responds and what the dough looks like after each stretch and fold because it does start to form bubbles it starts to produce gas and we want to do our six stretch and folds over the next two and a half to three and a half hours I give that extra hour grace because a lot of times I walk away and get distracted I don't set a timer and I come back an hour later or I come back 40 minutes later or it sits for longer than it should and I do my stretch and fold so this part, I'm not incredibly strict, but our house is also on the cooler side. It's about 68 degrees, so it does take a little bit longer for fermentation in a cooler environment, so that's why I give some grace. Pay attention to your dough, and when it's becoming light and fluffy and filled with air, then you know that it has reached its peak fermentation. So this is what I do each time, cover it up. 30 minutes later, after it has sat here and rested and absorbed some more water, you can see that it's becoming more stretchy this time. I'm able to stretch it a little better than I was the first time when it was super dense. And this is allowing me to do my four stretch and fold. So I just do the four, sometimes I do five if I lose count. And I press my dough down and I do that just to get rid of any of the big air pockets that are in it. I always massage or press my dough down. Then I cover it back up with a damp cloth and it sits for another 30 minutes or so. Now we are approaching our second stretch and fold. This is, I'm counting this as my second. The first was just the squish. The first we did the squishy saltwater squish and then we did a 30 minute rest. Then we did our stretch and fold for the first time. We've done a 30 minute rest. 
I took off my rings and I wet my hands so that the dough doesn't stick to my hands. There's your trick. You can see that there was just a few little air bubbles in there from the first stretch and fold, but those are going to increase every single stretch and fold. You're going to see a little bit more bubbles, a little bit more bubbles, a little bit more bubbles in the bottom of the bowl. You can also see that this dough is stretching a lot better now that it's absorbed all the water, now that it's sat there and rested, now that it is starting to produce gas in the dough, it is starting to become more forgiving and more flexible. So we're going to do the four stretch and folds rotating our bowl each time and then we are going to cover this back up with a damp cloth and let it rest for 30 more minutes. You can see now that my dough is becoming less dense. It is becoming light and airy. And you can see that when I stretch it and when I fold it over, you can see all those little burst air bubbles in the surface of the dough. So you can tell that it's just getting light and squishy, just like a beautiful, fluffy, soft bread dough, like how we want it to be. So this is gonna get covered again and it's gonna go for another little 30 minute rest. Set your timers if you're gonna forget. I often do, um, but I try to just check the time and say, okay, I'll come back at such and such time and I try to be just wise and aware. Okay, so like I said, I didn't record all of the stretch and folds, but you get the idea. You do it six times within two and a half, three hours. And then what I do is this time I did a bulk ferment. So I actually covered this up and put it in the refrigerator overnight. Do you see all those beautiful, beautiful, beautiful little bubbles? So if you run out of time like I did yesterday, then you can do that. You can cover your sourdough really well. I put mine in a plastic bag. Um, and you can refrigerate it. And what that does is it retards the fermentation. It slows it down enough to give you time to where you can finish your sourdough. So oftentimes what I do is divide it up the night before. And I do this process the night before the same day that I make the dough. I go ahead and divide it up and put it into my baskets. And then I refrigerate it. But this time I did not do that. So you're going to see how forgiving this is and that you can do it a variety of ways and you don't have to be super super strict as long as you're paying attention to your dough and the quality of your dough what your dough feels like what it looks like you can see all those beautiful bubbles in there you know that it's going to be a fluffy producer it's going to it's going to have that oven rise that oven pop that oven spring that gives it its lightweight fluffiness and its crusty crust so i'm going to divide this up into four I'm going to do that now, and typically when I weigh these out, it's about 720 grams each. Each one of these, even if you do a, uh, a single batch, which produces two bulls, each bull would be about 720 grams if you want to weigh them out. And when I used to sell my bread, I always used a scale, and I always measured my dough out precisely. But I no longer do that. I just eyeball it and wing it, and it works fine for me and my family. You know, my kids aren't going to be weighing the dough and saying, Mom, you gypped us on this loaf. Like, they don't care. So I no longer weigh my dough. I just split it up into fours. And then what we're going to do is rough shape these so that they can sit here and rest for 30 minutes. So I'm just going to kind of rough shape them. And how I rough shape them is I just take my my baking blade, my blade here, my dough blade, and I just slide the dough. What happens is the dough on the bottom grabs on the table, it kind of sticks to the table, and then creates tension in the surface of the dough, which is also going to help your oven spring. It's going to help maintain the shape of your round bowl. So you can just see that I'm gently going to shove the outsides underneath and slide it across the table. I'm not really sure how to describe that, but hopefully you see what I'm doing. I'm just kind of gently folding, tucking, sliding, just to get these in a rough round shape so that when I make my final shape, it's all nice and even. So I'm gonna speed this up so you can kind of see the process.
And here's how you use your hands to do it. It's just the same thing. You just place your hands in the front of the dough and then you pull the dough towards you and rotate counterclockwise and just keep doing that and that will make the same nice beautiful shape so sometimes that baking blade is a pain sometimes it works well but i got kind of frustrated with it and i like the form that my hands make better i'm also popping out some of the bubbles you saw me slapping the dough i don't like those big gaping bubbles and air pockets in my dough so i do press my dough um, and slap those out when they arise to the surface so we're going to cover these with our damp cloth still using the same damp cloth that i was using that i've been using this whole time and i get these flour sack towels from walmart and i buy them in the tin packs because this mama is always baking bread and i always need some clean white towels for this process so you can pick yours up there and then these are the baskets that I use. I also have some proper bannetons, which is what they are called. I have some wicker bannetons, um, but I prefer using these little plastic restaurant bread baskets. I like the shape of them. And I just use my flour, my floured cloth on the inside. I'm gonna show you how I do that. I just put a little bit of flour in my sifter and then I sift a little bit. I just kind of shake it over top of my baskets to coat the fabric and flour so that my dough doesn't stick. I also flour my dough when I'm doing my final shaping and I make sure that it's floured all the way around so that there is nothing sticking to the fabric when I bind the dough up in the fabric. I'm having a good time. We are listening to worship music on this morning and I'm just really enjoying it, dancing around, making my bread. There are different ways to do your final shaping. This is my method and how I do that. So I'm just gonna share that with you. I stretch and fold my dough four times just as I did in the large bowl. And then I flip the dough over and I just kind of shape it a little more with my hands dragging it towards me, creating that tension. And then I flour all of the dough and pop it in the basket. And some people do like I do and some people don't, but I like to wrap my dough and that keeps the crumb tight. It keeps it from expanding too much. It still produces a lot of gas. It still produces lots of air pockets in there, but I like to refrigerate these for a few days in the refrigerator or at least overnight. And by wrapping it like that, it keeps my dough's shape. So it's a nice round ball. That way it has a beautiful oven spring. It's just another trick that I do. And I know not everybody does this with their bread. It's my method and what I found works for me and you will find your own groove and what works for you. And I'm sure if you watch other people make sourdough that you will pick up little tips and tricks along the way from each person. That is how I learned sourdough. I watched many people. I learned from my Aunt Chanin um, and I learned from the internet and from YouTube how to make sourdough. I did a lot of reading. I stressed out about all the scientific aspects of it. And then I just learned, you know what? It comes with a lot of feel. Um, it just comes with experience. You learn your bread. You learn what the dough is doing and what kind of dough, like when it's overproved. That is something you will learn with experience. So you may not learn what overproved dough is until you botch a batch of your dough. And that's okay because when you make mistakes like that, you can learn from them. And with your overproved dough, just make focaccia or throw it down and make a pizza or whatever when you recognize that you overprove it. Your sourdough is never gonna go to waste because there are a variety of ways that you can utilize it. You can make donuts or whatever if you if you mess it up. Um, you know, it's okay. It'll still be edible in some form, some capacity. But I hope that this video has helped you see some of my method to my madness and how I make my sourdough bread. And maybe that gives you a little bit of clarity and a little bit of empowerment to go on and make your own bread for your family. Sourdough is a great bread to eat because it is a fermented grain and that is going to be easy on digestion. It's going to help your body uh, use the proteins in the bread and um, it's going to help your body easily digest the bread because it's already been pre-digested by the natural yeasts that are present in your sourdough. All the live active bacteria that is in there um, that is good at breaking down the phytic acid in the grain and 
just makes it better for us all around. So uh, if I can make sourdough bread for my family of seven, certainly you can do this too. Again, check out my playlist for all the information to make your own starter. I have videos on scoring sourdough bread, but we're going to go over that here in just a minute when we bake this. But I've got videos on shaping and scoring and um, just so many videos there for you all that I hope you find helpful. helpful. If you have extra questions in addition to what I've spoken about on this video, please ask them down below in the comments. After final shaping, you can either leave your bread out to rest for three hours before baking, or you can refrigerate it for the day or overnight again before baking, but it does need to rest after that stretch and fold before you score it and bake it. All the dough has to stick together and do its thing and ferment a little bit more, and then we can move on to this next step. I'm gauging interest right now. I can dry out sourdough starter and ship it. So that is something I've been toying with the idea of. If that is something you would be interested in, you can comment down below. Also, you can email me at rousrising at gmail.com. That email address is linked down below in this video's description. So you can just reach out to me and say, hey, Katie, I want a starter. I'm going to play with it. I'm going to see if I can dehydrate starter and get it re-going, rehydrated. And if I can do that, then I am happy to um, help you guys get your own sourdough starter. If you don't want to make it by yourself and you want to try a rehydration situation, we can do that. I just have to figure up the cost and the shipping and everything like that. So right now, I think I'm just trying to gauge interest. So here I am going to score this sourdough. I'm going to skip showing you this whole first one because I was trying to make Sasquatch in the dough and I failed miserably. So let's just skip to the next one and let me show you how I score that. Okay, well, I decided to get fancy with this one. My camera turned off at some point and I just made some guidelines with my uh, baker's scraper bench. What is it? A bench knife. I made some guidelines with my bench knife. It didn't actually cut through the dough. And then with those guidelines, I am doing my little scores and I'm just trying to make a fancy little loaf. Uh, for the holiday here. So I'm going to do a little bit of a Christmas tree design on it. Um, and then if you need to see a better, more precise video about shaping and scoring, I'll link that down below in this video's description. I have a more straightforward slash that I use, but on this particular day, I was just trying to be artsy with my sourdough. Once I have scored my dough, it goes directly into a preheated 500 degrees Fahrenheit Dutch oven. So I've got two Dutch ovens, one's enamel coated, one is not. They both work the absolute same. The reason why we bake in a covered dish is because this helps with the steam in the oven spring. This helps your bread dough pop right up. After the first 15 minutes at 500 degrees, I just lowered the temperature down to 425 and I left the lids on for another 10 minutes. After 10 minutes at 425, I open up the oven and I remove the lids to my Dutch ovens and I let the bread cook for another seven to 10 minutes, depending on how browned I want it, depending on how hard and crusty I want it. So you just, you know, you're gonna learn this too, but this baking time and method ensures that the inside of my bread is completely done. Do not remove your bread from the oven any sooner than what I have mentioned because it will result in a wet, doughy, gooey center and nobody likes dough <laughs> bread. So you definitely want to make sure that you do the full cooking time. It is going to darken the outside of the crust. You do want that. You need that darkening. You need that doneness throughout. You can thump the bottom of the loaf to make sure it sounds hollow. If it doesn't sound hollow, then it's still too dense and it needs to bake longer. But this is the inside of my sourdough. You can see that I have a nice, tight, well done crumb from my baking method. And like I said earlier in this video, this is the crumb that we prefer. Sure, I can make it have huge gaping holes, that would be if I just stretched and folded it and didn't press it down. If I didn't massage those huge air gas bubbles out of there, I would have bigger holes. If I would have let it ferment longer at room temperature, it would have had larger holes. But my method and the type of flours that I use result in this delicious bread that 
I prefer for my family. So you will see what works for you and what you and your family prefers as far as your bread goes. And I can guarantee you all are going to love it. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today and making this beautiful bread along with me. I hope that you learned from this video. I hope you are inspired to go and make your own sourdough bread today. And leave me a comment down below what you think of this. Give this video a like, a thumbs up. Be sure to click subscribe if you haven't subscribed to my channel already. We share lots of nourishing foods and family traditions with you all here on Rouse Rising, and we would love to have you a part of our family. Thank you so much for joining me today. Until next time, you all. Bye.